What common thread links most of the 5th edition D&D adventures together? It's a set of mysterious obelisks, and we're going to talk about them, but spoilers uh, for a lot of D&D 5e adventures. You have been warned. Hey everybody, Jordan here, the PH is silent. And this video, we're gonna talk about the unknown obelisks and what they do uh, in Dungeons and Dragons. So in fifth edition D&D, uh, they've been sprinkling these weird magical obelisks and they come in different sizes. Uh, I believe they're always kind of the same shape and the same material. They're just a black uh, obsidian obelisk, but they can be very large. They could be um, quite small and they, don't serve a story purpose for any of those stories, but there is a theory that all of them connected uh, is a longer purpose. And specifically, Rhyme of the Frost Maiden gave us uh, a bunch of extra info about the obelisks and potentially the future of the Forgotten Realms. So uh, in researching this, I've made a, a bunch of, well, here, I'll just shift over. So uh, I use Notion, notion.so, to do my game organizations, and I actually use it for a lot of stuff. Uh, but specifically, I started a Secret of the Obelisks um, page. So this is, the, this is a page that I created to kind of put everything in one spot. So I, I copied over uh, stuff from the various things. So these are news articles up here. Um, and by news articles, they're Reddit threads and various forums and stuff that talk of the ramifications. So we're, we'll get to this in a minute, but but right now let's go to um, with unknown obelisks and without obelisks. So uh, correct me if I'm wrong. And if somebody in the comments wants to, or if you want to leave a comment uh, that, um, hey Jordan, there is an obelisk in this adventure. That would be awesome because I could not find um, obelisk references in um, these adventures over here. But these adventures right here totally have an obelisk in them, and we're going to go one by one and, and read up on them. Uh, but basically, the obelisks are, they vary in size, they're always black, and they have some kind of magic associated with them that doesn't, you, sometimes it's a specific school of magic and sometimes it's not. Um, and then the big surprise is within some of these is like a, a trapped creature, like a celestial or a devil or something like that. So let's let's just go down the list here. Um, Princes of the Apocalypse. Uh, this is in the Shrine of the Bleeding Stone. An irregular pit fills the center of this large hall. In the middle of the pit stands an obelisk of glistening black stone. Bleached bones lie scattered near the foot of the obelisk. A smaller stone post in front of the obelisk holds a pair of manacles, which now confine a strange gnome with gray skin and a bald head. So in Princes of the Apocalypse, uh, we, we have this obelisk here. Um, and uh, it has this has a link to uh, the uh, Earth Cult, because uh, the Earth Cult leader and things like that. And the gnome is an explorer who is captured. Uh, so we don't get a lot other than there is an obelisk here. Um, there's a pudding within the obelisk. So if we read this, um, the, the deep known uh, Rook uh, glitter stone to the stone post, blah, 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 uh, intends to offer him as a sacrifice to the black pudding. When the pudding emerges, it seeps out of the obelisk like thick black blood and attacks the gnome first, um, only after the gnome is consumed. So the cracked obelisk, this could be a sign that the creature was already let go and, and it just resides inside of there because of the nature of it, or maybe it's still tethered to that, we're not really sure. Um, but you get some information. Um, and then in F11, which is another subsection of, or section of Princes of the Apocalypse, uh, this cavern is a vertical shaft rising up the shaft. It's a black stone obelisk 20 feet on a side with a stone staircase wrapping around its sides, ascending into the darkness. And that is the only information I found about this obelisk. But basically there is kind of two in this adventure. Now we go to uh, Out of the Abyss and Grackelstug. So in Grackelstug, there is an obelisk made of black 
metal, alien origin, and this monolith is perfectly smooth except for the cracks and chipped off edges and splintered, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it is 15 feet per side at its base and it stands 50 feet tall and tapers into a pyramid cap like an obelisk should. Um, any character proficient in Arcana can, can tell that the obelisk fractures are leaking quasi-magical energy. Uh, the character further understands that feeding magical energy into the obelisk might activate its latent magic. Spending a spell slot of any level while touching the obelisk activates it and teleports everyone to the mesa in a location in the Underdark just outside the northwest gate of uh, Grackelstug. Now, the character who expends the spell, sl spell slot knows the teleport effect can be repeated, but that its power is only temporary. A fluke due to the recent disruption of the uh, phaseris throughout the Underdark, which is part of the storyline, both the potency and the nature of the effect could change within a week or so, uh, and this teleport effect likely bears no relation to the obelisk's actual purpose. Um, if the characters took a lump of metal from uh, Droki and the Grey Ghost, they notice the obelisk is made from the same material, and if the lump is touched the obelisk, it is instantly absorbed, repairing the crack on its surface. So what caused that crack, we don't know, but again, just a black metal alien obelisk. Not sure what it does, but it heals itself. Um, Storm King's Thunder references the obelisk, but we don't actually physically see one. So Nightstone, the city of Nightstone, got its name. Oh, and yeah, here's the obelisk here. So Nightstone got its name from a massive chunk of obsidian that once stood in the middle of the village square. The obsidian megalith had strange glyphs carved into it and radiated magic under the scrutiny of a detect magic spell, but its properties and purpose couldn't be ascertained. The villages assumed it was a relic of some bygone age or kingdom and left it alone. Um, and then the giant lords took that. Uh, the, uh, so, uh, uh, and here we have creating new giant lords. So in a subsection of uh, Storm King's Thunder, you can kind of expand upon some of the uh, adventure hooks that didn't get super uh, finished. And so uh, from here, it says, the adventure focuses on the machinations of a few giant lords, but there aren't, but they aren't the only evil giants uh, vying for glory and their gods' admiration. Other giant lords might be engaged in foul plots throughout the north, and here are a few examples, and this is one. So a cloud giant wizard planning to cast an apocalyptic spell using a large obsidian rock called a nightstone as a material component. So something about this nightstone can be used to do an apocalyptic style scout, or spell. Then we jump over to Tomb of Annihilation, and here's the obelisk here, Mer arrow. Um, this obelisk, the obelisk radiates a strong aura of abjuration magic. Um, before, the obelisk that they touched would teleport you. It didn't specifically say conjuration magic, uh, but conjuration is teleportation, so we could assume. Um, under the scrutiny of a detect magic spell or similar magic, and a paladin using divine sense can detect a fiendish presence within this obelisk. Clearing the vines and moss away from the south face of the obelisk exposes a message carved into it in common. And the message reads as follows. Fear the night when the forsaken one seizes death's mantle and the seas dry up and the dead rise. And I, a Serac the Eternal, reap the world of the living. Those who dare enter, take heed. The enemies oppose. One stands between them in darkness it hides, don the mask or be seen, speak no truth to the doomed child, the keys turn on the inside only. Now, all of these warnings have been placed there by Aserak, but I don't think he placed the obelisk. And the warnings, all of that translates into stuff, uh, they are clues for the players that go within the Tomb of Annihilation, but it has nothing really to do with this obelisk and the fiendish creature trapped inside. Um, characters with a combined strength of 60 or more can topple the obelisk, bringing it off at the base, and breaking or destroying the obelisk releases a cloud of black smoke that coalesces into a Nafshini demon. The demon appears in an unoccupied space within 30 feet of the obelisk and attacks those responsible for the obelisk's desecration. And after one minute, the demon disappears and returns to the abyss. Um, the teleportation function of the ebon pool returns characters to the obelisk, even if it is toppled or destroyed. So I'm not sure if that's connected by a Sarak or if that's connected in some other way. Um, also, if you're a fan of Puffin Forest, he did a fun video on this about uh, playing Adventure League and running this scenario and 
yeah, w what does it all mean? Um, and then Waterdeep Dragon High slash Dungeon of the Mad Mage, we're gonna focus on Dungeon of the Mad Mage. Uh, in level 22, there is a black obelisk. This is a 20 foot high room containing a single object, a 15 foot tall tapered obelisk of black stone situated in the middle of the room. The shadow desks found the obelisk on another level of Undermountain and brought it here after subjecting it to far realm energies. It radiates a strong aura of abjuration magic under the scrutiny of a detect magic spell or similar magic. And a paladin using divine sense can detect a celestial presence trapped within. So I think by, I think they planted some clues in the previous, uh, previous adventures but this Dungeon of the Mad Mage and out of, and uh, not out of the abyss, but Dungeon of the Mad Mage specifically and Tomb of Annihilation, we have trapped creatures within these obelisks. And the same thing, abjuration magic, uh, divine sense senses something within it. So these are different heights and all that other stuff, but I, I think they could be the same. Characters uh, who have a combined strength of 60 can topple the obelisk, uh, and it has immunity, but, but toppling or destroying the obelisk releases a Kowadl trapped within. The Kowadl is named Tezka Zanya, uh, which is not anything I could dissertain or I could figure out. So I think it's just uh, made up for the adventure, but it appears in the form of a tiny yellow frog uh, because it doesn't necessarily want to give itself away as a Kowadl just yet. Using its telepathy, the disguised Kowadl thanks the characters for releasing it, and exposure to the Far Realm has deprived the Kowadl of its memories, including those that would explain its entrapment and the purpose of the obelisk. If the party includes no evil characters, uh, the, the Kowadl, uh, Tezka Zenya offers to accompany its rescuers and assist them until its services are no longer required. It continues to pass itself off as a frog until circumstances force it to reveal its true form. Trapped in the obelisk for a millennia, it knows nothing about Undermountain or Waterdeep. So it was brought here. Um, Baldur's Gate, Descent into Avernus. This one's a little weird and gets into some interesting stuff, but let's talk about it. So within um, Avernus, so hell, we're in a whole other plane. We're not on the prime material plane anymore. Um, there is a 30 foot tall obelisk ringed by seven smaller standing stones rising from the crest of the hill. A tall man wearing tattered robes strides between the standing stones, uh, gesticulating wildly and screaming curses into the wind. Now, this guy is trying to be a wizard. So he says, uh, a wizard that, uh, the, the wizard claims that each standing stone is keyed to one of the eight schools of magic. Abjuration, conjuration, divination, enchantment, evocation, illusion, necromancy, and transmutation. His theory suggests that the central obelisk grants a boost in arcane power to mages across the cosmos, and he urges the characters to aid him in empowering it. In truth, Ubalux has concocted this theory to dupe the characters into testing his latest escape plan. So this is actually holding uh, a fiend trapped here. Um, characters who examine the standing stones and succeed on a 15 intelligence arcana check discern that the arcane runes do indeed relate to the eight schools of magic. The wizard requests that each character place their hands on a different stone to assist in channeling the streams of magic. Uh, when their hands are in place, Ubalux begins to chant and the air fills with ozone as lightning courses over the standing stones. Each character who participates in the experiment takes 22 lightning damage, whoop, takes 22 lightning damage and suffers an additional effect based on the school of magic associated with the standing stone that the character touched. As noted in the standing stone effects table, Ubalux attempt, Ubalux's latest attempt to escape his prison has failed. Um, now the standing tone, this has effects. So as you like touch it and, and channel energy, um, the abjuration one, you'll get a plus two for the, uh, to your AC for the next 24 hours. Uh, conjuration, a monodrome appears. And that's another video I wanna make. There's a lot of uh, monodromes and, and whatnot uh, that pop up in various adventures. Um, and it follows you around until it's destroyed. Um, divination, you gain the benefits, benefits of true seeing for the next hour. Enchantment, uh, the standing stone casts confusion on you. Um, evocation, the standing stone casts magic missile. 
Um, illusion, an illusionary swarm of harmless bats or pigeons flutters over your head for the next hour. A dispel magic cast on the swarm ends. Necromancy, you take 30 necrotic damage. Uh, and transmutation, your skin turns blue for the next 24 hours. So if this happens, the, the, uh, drop, the creature will drop its disguise. Um, the Balgura demon implores the characters to seek out Mephistopheles and return with an answer to his puzzle. The Bulgara then gives them directions to a magic mirror, uh, the mirror of Mephestar that can be used to gaze into uh, uh, Kania, which is another realm of the Nine Hells, and contact the Archdevil. If the characters win over Mephistopheles, uh, Ubalix promises to guide them to someone who can help them uh, find the Bleeding Citadel. So that's all part of the thing. Uh, part of the adventure of Avernus, but weird obelisks. Now we get to Icewind Dale, Rime of the Frost Maiden. So in uh, Rime of the Frost Maiden, there is a, uh, a crashed Netherese uh, flying fortress. And this is big. Um, and, and so we got a lot of information. Rhyme of the Frost Maiden was like a big key to the puzzle. So a 60 foot tall obelisk of black stone, its surface covered in arcane runes, projects from the ground. A thin crack has formed on one side, stretching from the obelisk's base to its middle. Now this, uh, this is a, a flying fortress, Netherese fortress named Yithrin. And before Yithrin crashed, uh, oh, those names, Iriolath, Larthas <laughs> relied on the obelisk as a precautionary measure in case Yithrin experienced a catastrophe. It was one of the few rare Netherese artifacts that could rewind time. Now we're gonna read about the secrets of the obelisk sidebar later. It was damaged during the fall and despite uh, the, uh, ir Irilarthas, and despite Irilarthas uh, best efforts, the Demi-Lich could not repair it. Characters who learn about the obelisk uh, in this wizard study, uh, you know how to activate it. See activating the obelisk below. A character who examines the obelisk and succeeds on a DC 10 intelligence arcana check recognizes that the magic rooms inscribed on the obelisk represent all eight schools of magic. If the check results uh, exceeded by five or more, the character also identifies the runes relating to chronomancy, which is the art of magically manipulating time. And now, this is how you activate the obelisk. If the characters retrieve um, this wizard's staff of power, Veneranda is with, and Veneranda is with them, she insists that the staff be used to activate the dormant obelisk. Any character who succeeds on a 20 arcana check can verify that the task is not beyond the staff's power, although it would take at least half of the staff's charges uh, to accomplish this. If a creature attuned to the staff uses an action to expend 10 or more of its charges while touching the staff to the obelisk, the power surges from the staff and triggers the following devastating events. The staff splits in half, triggering its retributive strike property, uh, which is in the Dungeon Master's Guide. And basically that is, so retributive strike, you can use an action to break uh, the staff on your knee and you perform this strike. Now, if the staff is destroyed and releases its remaining magic, uh, there's an explosion that fills a 30 foot radius and you have a 50% chance to instantly travel to a random plane of existence and avoid the explosion. If you fail to avoid the effect, you take force damage equal to 16 times the number of charges on the staff. Uh, every other creature in the area must make a DC 17 dexterity saving throw. On a failed save, a creature takes an amount of damage based on how far away it is from the point of origin as shown on the table below. So, but you, you just take 16 times the number, but you have a 50% chance of, of winning or of living. It's really exciting. Um, then uh, another one, any creature with 120 feet of the obelisk that isn't killed by the staff's explosion becomes 10 years younger, chronomancy. Creatures who age in Age is reduced to zero by this effect, wink out of existence, leaving behind the items they were wearing or carrying. The obelisk disintegrates, as do other obelisks like it throughout the world, but not before hurling the entire planet into the past, to a time prior to the fall of Yethrin. Year of Chilled Morrow. If the characters use the Staff of Power to activate the obelisk in Yethrin, they inadvertently reset the world 
to a time predating the fall of Yethrin and the end of the Netheril, the obelisk has sent them back to the spring of negative 343 DR, the year of chilled Maro, six months prior to the catastrophe that causes Yithrin's fall and another four years before Netheril's demise. The characters find themselves high in the sky over Icewind Dale, um, and we'll use the following box here. So the obelisk is gone, leaving an indentation in the ground where it once stood. In its place is an Aarakocra with brilliantly covered plumage. Using telepathy, it reaches out to each of you in turn and introduces itself as Nikali, I'm released from a duty long forgotten, it says. The world has rolled back more than 1,500 years. Now, history can be rewritten. The city is no longer trapped beneath the uh, uh, Reghead Glacier. Instead, it drifts among the clouds, its spires and other structures agleam and undamaged. A sky coach glides overhead, bathing you briefly in its shadow before making its way towards the city's glass-enclosed uh, glass sky dock. Weaving between the city spires are boulevards traversed by tall humans of noble bearing in wizardry robes, many of them accompanied by hairless green-skinned humanoids that serve as their valet and bodyguards. Some take note of your presence while others gawk at, an, at the empty space where the obelisk once stood. So, uh, Nikali, is, the Aarakocra, is another quaddle uh, shape changed into the form of an Aarakocra. It doesn't remember why it was bound to the obelisk or who did it. Uh, but it knows that it is free of the obligation to the obelisk's builders, um, and that it is aware that time has reversed, going back 1,500 years. Um, your, if your characters do this, they're just thrown back. That's amazing. So Yithrin is now a floating city, um, and there's a lich that controls it, uh, and you get to start a new campaign in uh, the Netheril Age, which is kind of exciting and interesting. Uh, to put it mildly, the characters have a whole new world to explore. Ten Towns doesn't exist in this timeline, and nor do most of the cities along the Sword Coast, so you just, you get to do whatever you want. It's amazing. Um, some final notes. Uh, we're gonna talk about uh, Dugan's Hole. hey -o. Uh Dugan's Hole uh, is, uh, uh, is down here, 20 stones of th uh, Thrun. Um, the only truly interesting feature of Dugan's Hole, and this is also part of Icewind Dale, is the ring of megaliths known as the 20 Stones of Thrun. Standing at the southern edge of the town, 19 of these crudely fashioned granite uh, meniers are men, men hires? Mm. Men here. Men here. Okay. Granite men here are arranged in a, a rough triangle with a single stone in the formation center. No one knows who built the structure or why. The townsfolk maintain that the stones were there when the town's founder, um, a Chandothan named Dugan Dubrace, first appeared upon the fishing spot. Scholars have tried to research the origins of the structure's name, but they all have found. Uh, but all they have found are allusions to a creature named Thrun in the oldest legends in the northern folk. Some speculate that Thrun was a god, while others believe it is a destructive elemental spirit bound to this location by ancient druidic magic. This might not have anything to do with it, but I thought it was really weird, and I wanted to include it because it could mean something. Now, um, the secrets of the obelisks. This was introduced uh, in... Uh, Icewind Dale as well. Um, and so it says, in this adventure, we learn that the secret of the obelisks that have appeared in other fifth edition adventures published by Wizards of the Coast, including Tomb of Annihilation and Waterdeep Dungeon of the Mad Mage. The first group of these magical obelisks was crafted by a secret society of spellcasters called the Weavers. These obelisks can alter reality on a grand scale sending a region or an entire world back to an earlier time, effectively erasing part of history. The obelisks were constructed to counteract the effects of a calamitous spells and, and cataclysmic events. An evil wizard named Vecna stole one such obelisk and used it to erase the obelisk creators from existence. Vecna also stole the knowledge needed to create new ones. That knowledge later came into the possession of Netherese wizards who built similar obelisks of their own. They believe that if some catastrophe destroyed their empire, <coughs> cough, curses his folly, their obelisks could help restore it. Unfortunately for them, most of the obelisks built to protect Netheril were stolen or otherwise lost over time, as were records of their purpose and information about how to activate them. So what we have now 
is a giant reset button on the Forgotten Realms. Um, if they introduce an, an adventure, they could pull from these little things that they put in here, these obelisks, and say, there was a, a catastrophe, something happened, we're rewinding the clock, and I don't know, 2024 is gonna be not only the 10th anniversary of 5th edition D&D, but also the 50th anniversary of Dungeons and & Dragons. And you know Wizards of the Coast wants to do something big for that. It would make sense to me if we got a new edition of D&D that coincided with the Netherese. And we go back in time and we play D&D like back in older than Faerun times with the Netheril, new characters, new all of this other stuff. Uh, that's not only my theory, that is the theory of a bunch of other people. Um, going back up to the top here, uh, there are these links, and I will put these links into uh, the, the video below so you can check them out as well, but um, huge ramifications for this. And so I wanted to know what you guys thought. I don't know if a lot of people know about this, about the obelisks, or are talking about the obelisks, so I wanted to make a video on it, um, but what do you guys think? Are, are we setting? Are we setting up for a 2024 adventure slash world changing event to get rid of the spell plague from happening once and for all? We'll just erase fourth edition entirely. Uh, I don't know. And if you watch my Vecna videos, which uh, I'll put a link around here, you can check those out. Uh, Vecna has gone from Greyhawk to uh, Ravenloft campaign setting, and he, he appears at a bunch of different places. He's a deity now, sometimes he's not a deity. But in those adventures, uh, he, I don't know, that he could make a comeback. Maybe he will be the main antagonist for 6th edition Dungeons & Dragons. If any of you know of extra uh, obelisks in any of these adventures, please uh, leave me a comment below and I will read it and I will thank you and I will make a follow-up video. Um, the only other thing that I wanted to talk about before we leave really quick um, is there was some errata with uh, the Sword Coast Adventures Guide. And it was errata on lore and specifically the afterlife. It says, in the second paragraph, the last sentence has been deleted. And I don't think necessarily that this is tied to uh, the Forgotten Realms, um, or it's, sorry, I should say, I don't think this is necessarily tied to th the obelisks, but it was peculiar as to why, unless they're going to introduce something later on that doesn't connect. I'm not really sure. So let's read this. Um, the Afterlife. This is uh, page 20 of the Sword Coast Adventures Guide. Most humans believe the souls of the recently deceased are spirited away to the Fuke Plain, where they wander the great city of judgment, often unaware they are dead. The servants of the gods come to collect such souls, and if they are worthy, they are taking, taken to their awaited afterlife in the deity's domain. Occasionally, the faithful are sent back to be reborn into the world to finish work that was left undone. Souls that are unclaimed by the servants of the gods are judged by Kelimvor, who decides the fate of each one. Some are charged with serving as guides for other lost souls, while others are transformed into squirming larvae and cast into dust. This is the sentence that was removed. The truly false and faithless are mortared into the wall of the faithless, the great barrier that bounds the city of the dead where the souls slowly dissolve and begin to become part of the stuff of the wall itself. Now, I haven't done a video on the City of Judgment, um, but I, I wanted to check it out. There is a wall that goes around this mythical city. Um, it was held by other gods of death, and then uh, uh, Merkel came in, and he was the god of death, and he did a bunch of stuff. Finally, when Kelimvor took it over, he created a crystal spire because he wanted it to be transparent, and he didn't want to he didn't want to go through all this rigmarole. So uh, it's it's a tightly packed metropolis on the Fugue Plain. It's colorless. Uh, it is a purposefully bland city, home to the Crystal Spire where Kelimvor and uh, Jergal live. The Wall of the Faithless was a wall built from souls of those Kelimvor judged as faithless. 
and they formed bricks that held together by a supernatural greenish mold. Um, and I incorrectly thought that this was uh, atheists, but that was not the case. And a lot of people pointed out, I made a couple of posts about this and they were like, ah, I don't think that's what it means. So the faithless are those who just choose to not follow. Um, I wanna say acknowledge, but I think that's wrong. But they they just have no faith in the deities. Like, you know, you can still acknowledge them and not enjoy who they are kind of a thing. Uh, so it's almost like, like, uh, uh, Sloth and the Seven Deadly Sins, like to to be that apathetic and to not have any faith, is more of a worse crime than than being evil or something like that. So, it, I don't know. It's kind of interesting. Uh, the wall of the faithless surrounds the city of judgment. In the Great Will cosmology, it is in uh, Oinos, which is a layer of Hades. Uh, the wall was erected by Merkel to punish souls of beings who claimed no patron god. Um, the Crystal Tower was originally known as the Bone Castle. Uh, but when, and I mentioned this earlier, when Merkel took it over and then Siric uh, took Merkel's portfolio, Kellenvor took it over and changed it to a crystal because he wanted it as a symbol of fairness and transparency. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, what do you think? Do you think that errata is part of a greater uh, conspiracy of obelisks or why? Why take that? Why was that sentence needed to take out? I just don't, I don't really understand unless they just don't, I don't know. I feel like it has to do something with it's gonna counteract what they're gonna do in the future. Might not have anything to do with the obelisks, might have something to do with the obelisks. Uh, I, I just, I don't know. So I would be, I would be interested. Um, links down below if you're interested. Uh, thank you guys for watching. I'm gonna have some more videos like this as, as more information comes out. Uh, but if you are new to the channel, I do, a bunch of Dungeons and Dragons lore videos. Uh, if you're curious about different campaign settings or uh, the Forgotten Realms and things like that, check out my channel. I do lots of videos and I would love to have you subscribe. I will see you guys in another future uh, conspiracy video. Everybody get your tinfoil hats uh, because I think, I think Elminster is tracking our thoughts.